Right, good morning everyone and uh, welcome again to the uh, 2018 Anzac Day Rhodesia dedication. We thank Hobsonville RSA who kindly host us here again today as they've done for some 20 years now. As we do each year we pledge our allegiance to New Zealand and remember the New Zealand fallen. Thanks to Chuck Osborne today. Uh, Chuck, thanks for laying the wreath for us today. That's an important moment for, for all of us. As we've moved through the centenary years of World War I, our commemorations here have centred on the Gallipoli campaign of 1915, the Somme of 1916, which, where we saw Kiwis, South Africans and Rhodesians fighting together. Um, 1917 saw the start of the Allied Spring Offensive, the Flanders Offensive and other famous battles. And so to March 1918, as we stand here just over a hundred years ago, the German Spring Offensive began when the Germans pushed back across the Somme with 74 divisions and 6,500 artillery pieces west and south to the Marne River, at one point reaching within 80 kilometers of Paris. But they had spread themselves too thinly and at last the tide began to turn. By June they had lost over 600,000 600, men and many began to surrender and desert. By September the Allied forces had gained back all of the territory gained by Germany since the spring and showed no signs of stopping. It was over for the Germans and they scrambled to negotiate terms and as you know, uh, the armistice was signed on 11th November 1918. In a few short months time that'll be a, a hundred years. It, was, it had been a tumultuous year but at last that terrible war was over. So as we close our chapter in World War I over these last five years of commemoration, we again remember the role played by the Rhodesians in that theatre in the Royal Flying Corps, the King's African Rifle Corps with its Rhodesian platoon. And we also remember troops of the 1st and 2nd Rhodesia regiments, the Rhodesian Native Regiment and the VSIP in Southwest Africa and East Africa. All played their part and would, get, and would do so again in the even greater numbers in World War II. We take this opportunity each year to remember the sick, the disabled, and those who still carry the scars of war. Special thoughts go out today to Dennis Davison. Uh, Dennis is here. Uh, Dennis, <laughs> who already afflicted with muscular dystrophy, fell and broke his leg a couple of weeks ago. And thoughts also with Percy Purcell, who's had a stroke and is in rehabilitation at the moment. Best wishes to both you guys. And of course, some folks have passed on since last we met here. I'll read the role of those who passed on. There are names, these are names we've been made aware of or have been asked to make special mention. There are, of course, many more. You can go out to websites and read very long lists uh, of, of um, the various roles uh, of people passing. I'll start with the names of two of our very close circle here. Mary Stiebel, she died in October last year. As most of you know, Mary and her husband Tony were avid members of this association and a stalwart presence at, the, at these Anzac Game Day commemorations. On numerous occasions, Tony or Mary did us the honour of laying the wreath for our fallen Rhodesians. Jack Maddox. Jack died on 24th of May uh, last year. Jack was another de dedicated member of the association. Born in Napier in 1936, he joined the New Zealand Fire Service at, at Whangarei at the age of 18 and enjoyed a long career in the public and private sector in his field. In 1960, his adventurous spirit saw him leave for Africa, and he spent much of the next 24 years there. In 1968, during a spell back in New Zealand, he was one of the rescuers in the Wahine disaster, which occurred just on 50 years ago th this month. During his years in Africa, Jack became a Rhodesia citizen and volunteered for and was attested to the BSAP as a reservist in 1972 as the Bush War escalated. Jack was passionate about his African connection and was instrumental with others in the making of this memorial bell, which we ring on this day each year. Our thoughts go out to Jeanette and to Jack's wider family. The other names that I have on the roll are as follows. Brigadier William Arthur Godwin, Brigadier Vic Walker, Lieutenant Colonel Trevor Desfountain, Lieutenant Colonel Charlie Oust, RLI, Major Peter Arnold, Major Mary DeFries, RWS, RLI and 2 RAR,
Captain Dick Padgett, many of you will remember that Dick was instrumental in the founding of Sanger Lodge up at Inyanga. Sergeant Major Bo Sparrow, uh, he, did, he died a couple of years ago in Wally Inch over in Toowoomba, asked me to make special mention of Bo's passing. Kim Farmer, RLI. Peter Edward Gawthorpe, RLI. Danny van Skalkweg, RLI. Noel Fanico, RLI. Dr. Kevin Hewell, Sergeant Robert Beach, A.L. Butch Pelser, RLI, John Hutton Maudsley, Michael Ward, Tony Hahn, SAS, Derek Hatton, also known as the schoolboy hero for defending his parents' farm in a terrorist attack uh, in which his brother was killed, Peter Colin Walker, William Bill Collins, RAF World War II and BSAP, Frederick Albert Punter, BSAP, Stuart Irvin Curry, and finally Dave, David Duke Denning, RLI. Uh, he died just a few days ago uh, and in Cardiff. Uh, sadly, has no known relatives and a call has gone out to family and friends. If you know of any uh, links uh, to, to David Duke Denning, please let you or I know afterwards. And a name I received just this morning, John Kirkman, RLI, has passed on. I'll turn now to our commemoration to our own fallen. The poetry I've chosen today is called Songbooks of the War by Sieg Siegfried Sassoon. It is poetry of the First, war, First World War, appropriate a century on. But it carries a strange message, not so much lamenting loss as is so usual for war poetry, but a message that new generations may not understand the horror of war and actually begin to envy the fight. The poem goes like this. In 50 years when peace outshines, remembrance of the battle lines, adventurous lads will sigh and cast proud looks upon the plundered past. On summer morn and winter's night, their hearts will kindle for the fight, reading a snatch of soldier's song, savage and jaunty, fierce and strong. And through the angry marching rhymes of blind regret and haggard mirth, They'll envy us the dazzling times when sacrifice absolved our earth. Some ancient man with silver locks will lift his weary face to say, War was a fiend who stopped our clocks, although we met him grim and gay. And then he'll speak of Haig's last drive, marvelling that any came alive out of the shambles that men built and smashed to cleanse the world of guilt. But the boys with grin and sidelong glance will think poor granddad's day is done and dream of lads who fought in France and lived in time to share the fun. So 100 years on with one generation already gone and the next who knew the full horror of World War II and more recent wars dying away, the new generation and its leaders may actually marvel at the spirit of soldiering, comradeship, the battle cries and actually envy the fight as though they're missing something. Winston Churchill talked of war fever when he said, never, never, never believe any war will be smooth and easy or that anyone who embarks on that strange voyage can measure the tides and hurricanes he will encounter. The statesman who yields to war fever must realize that once the signal is given, he is no longer the master of policy, but the slave of unforeseeable and uncontrollable events. In another hundred years, who knows, people may stand as we are now remembering those lost in wars yet to come. It's a cruel circle for sure. But today we can only think of our own fallen. If they could talk, what would their advice be to younger generations eager to fight? Would they advise them to the words in the poem, envy us the dazzling times, as the poem says? I think not. 50 to 60 years of good lives lost, way too early. Children, grandchildren, these guys never not got to know. Today we remember them. Please now stand in silence, and during the silence, our sergeant will salute the flag. Please stand in silence.
grow not old as we are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. The going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them. Sergeant, uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, now that our dedication is over, um, and before you leave, uh, Hugh Bonkert would like to chat with you. Thanks, Rob. Greetings to you all, and thanks for turning out on this Anzac Day Parade. Before I start, I've got one item that I put to the end here, because it didn't actually fit into my speech, but it actually fits into, into Rob's speech. So I'll just add it in here, and um, this is no, no reflection on, on Rob's research. This is because this information has only recently come to light during the course of our Rhodesian Archives <coughs> um, project, which is our online project recording roles of honour um, and nominal roles. This has been re carefully researched by Chuck Osborne, who's engaged with doing the, the last of our role of honour. We've got all of our role of honour is complete, as complete as a role of honour can get. Of course, you know, we'll be finding names down the track. Um, Chuck's working on World War I. Everything else is, everything else is done. Pioneer, the Native Wars, um, <coughs> World War II, um, Malaya, and the Bush War, and all those service men and women who died in between wars. <coughs> so this is the last Rhodesian who was killed in action. Of course, many Rhodesians died after the end of the First World War from wounds and disease. This guy is the last man killed in action. Corporal Carly Duggan Thompson, service number 1837, <coughs> was killed in action on the 11th of November 1918. While serving with the 1st first, <coughs> first Regiment South African Infantry, he was formerly of the Rhodesia Regiment, he was due to go to England for a commission when he was killed. He is buried in the Hertz <coughs> Hestock churchyard in Nord, France. He is listed on the Bulawayo and District Roll of Honour, which is still is in the Bulawayo Post Office in Zimbabwe. Unfortunately, it is not open to the public. We are fortunate that there are people in Zimbabwe who are interested in recording history and they have helped us with photographs of the contents of the um, uh, the, uh, the, um, the rolls that are on those walls and that, that information is what Chuck's been working on. So anyway, I'll get on to what I came here to, um, uh, what I came here to talk about. Um, firstly, apologies from members of my family for their absence this year. My mum, Bryony, and my wife, Diana. Mum's 91 <coughs> and it's a long haul for her to Auckland. Um, Diana is using today to catch up with the vast amount of bookwork for the association in preparation of starting up the museum and HQ on Tuesday. Someone else who's missing this year is Percy Purcell. Um, per Percy's uh, uh, turned up to just about every Anzac Day parade here since um, <coughs> since since they began um, back in the back in the 1980s, I think. Uh, Percy had a stroke about a month ago and he's in, the, he's in the Acute Brain Injury Rehab Unit in Ranui. If anyone lives nearby, um, I'm sure you appreciate a visit. Um, please be aware, he might not know who you are, um, but um, he'll appreciate the visit anyway. <coughs> it, is usual, it is usual for us to have a guest speaker at this point to impart some of their family history on you, um, but this year I'm breaking from that, that tradition <coughs> because it is the Museum and HQ project that I want to talk to you about today. In case any of you have missed our special announcements by email and on the social media made a few days ago, from the 1st of May, we're leasing, a, we're leasing unit number 10, 14 Portside Drive, Mount Monganui, in order to set up our HQ and admin. It is an industrial unit with good access from everywhere. Once we've established the displays and settled things down, it'll be open to the public six days a week. We'll keep you informed. So if you're not on our email lists or if you're not getting our emails for some reason, 
then see me, get my address, get on the get on the email list. You can al you can always be on our um, on our Facebook group if that's um, your preferred method of um, communication. Um, you do get a more instant feedback of information on Facebook than with the email, simply because it takes time to put emails together. Um, and if I'm publishing to the whole um, to the whole 2,000 um, worldwide, then it takes about nine hours to feed out of my computer. <coughs> this this is a major move for us and the biggest project of this nature post Rhodesia. <coughs> We've been a, a good 15 years in getting to this milestone point. There's been hard work getting there, and from here on, we need maximum support. And I I can't I can't but underline the word maximum. If we are to ensure that the world can access reliable historic records of Rhodesia, as well as a central point of focus for Rhodesians, our descendants, and our friends, then I urge everyone to get in behind this association. It is time we unite our resources for one objective. We are too small, we are too few to be broken into little bands and groups around the place. Having individual groups and so on is fine, but overall we need the support. We need the support of everyone, especially in the commercial field. Our CQ store is well stocked. Please don't go buying stuff from, from others. Come, to a, come and have a look at us first. We may have it. We've probably got a better product, besides which the money goes into preserving Rhodesia, not to sending somebody to the Bahamas for a holiday. At this point, we've achieved our initial goal, and it far exceeds any other Rhodesian group focused on preserving history. We've achieved worldwide recognition, a solid base, a decent war chest in the bank, and many innovative and unique projects under our belt, including everything from manufacturing replica Rhodesian medals of high quality, I will add, to publishing, again, of exceedingly high quality, the Rhodesia Regiment 1899 to 1981, and as well as establishing our Rhodesian Forces Archive project online in order for people to be able to see every object that is in our museum will be photographed and beyond that be, be available for people to view, as well as collecting and, just, and <coughs> being able to search our nominal roles that I've already spoken about. It's important for us to be able to be able to display everything that we've got online because not everybody's going to going to be able to visit our museum. I've already had somebody somebody in Northland said, "Oh, I'm never going to be able to get down to Tauranga." I nearly wrote back and said, "We'll get on the naked bus. You can get on for a dollar," um, but I didn't. Um, I I haven't actually answered that email. Um, but it, it illustrates to me that not everybody can can see, but almost everybody's got access to a computer, and so. It's always been our objective to put the stuff online. Putting it online is a massive amount of work. It is huge, huge, huge work. I don't know how much time Chuck spends doing his role, but I know for myself, I spend, I spend a couple of hours a night editing um, the material that is coming through for, 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 the, for the role, never mind everything else. But that's okay. It has to be done. <coughs> As I said, it has to be done, and so far we've done it with donations, funds raised through, through goods in our CQ store. Every cent has been hard won, and we have used every kind of penny-pinching trick. Our mothers, I guess you all had a mother like mine, most of you, and she taught us to scrimp and how to scrape, <laughs> as well as everything we learned in our university-sanctioned country. Renting this property and establishing a museum and admin centre is, is, is the second step. We've achieved the first step, we are where we are now. The following step from the museum, our third step, will be to identify a supporting business with which to support the museum. Museums on their own don't earn a lot of money. You get very little gate through, throughput from the gate. We have to have a supporting business, just as Classic Flyers has a supporting business for their for their museum efforts. We need the same. We've got to we've 
for the last couple of years we've been looking at we've been seriously looking at things prior to that the late Colin Logie and I spent many hours in car in, in my car traveling around the country and we did nothing but talk of how we could we could make this work in order to in order to get to, in order to get to that stage we will move into a we will move into the an area where we will, we will take in worldwide investment. And that final step will take us to the fourth stage, which is property ownership. I'm looking forward to the future, especially the part where I don't have to drag a car load of stuff around with me everywhere. I, everywhere I go, I usually end up, as will happen today, with a car load of stuff, and I'll be going back with more than what I brought. I think today Henny's got a whole lot of stuff to give me, not only tools for the museum, um, but some valuable artefacts in the form of a, um, an SAS officer's uniform. I look forward to us having our own place, somewhere where I do not have to seek permission to get a parking place inside the boundary so that I don't have to employ a column of bearers to convey all the contents of my car to the parade square, and sometimes it's been in the rain. I'm looking forward to having a whole CQ store on display for the punters not just carrying a bag of bag of um, badges around, which I've got today, so see me afterwards if any of you want any, any of our lapel pins, please. <coughs> I'm looking forward to being able to mix and mingle with people, not be running around like a blue-tailed um, whatnot. I'm looking forward to creating an environment where the younger generation feel comfortable and where they can learn the truth about the heritage and <coughs> the country of their forebears that was called Rhodesia. And I'm sure you all enjoy a less stressed and grumpy Hugh Bomford. None of this comes gift wrapped on a plate, folks. It's going to be hard work. So let's get in behind and chover. I've said to you before, we like we like a bus. We need everybody to get off the bus and put their put their shoulder to the wheel and we'll get it going. The bottom line is of course money, and that's what makes everything happen happen. We need every bit of support that we can get. It's not just Rhodesians that contribute to our goal. It never has been. This association enjoys a wide support from people, some people who've never, never set foot in Rhodesia, but they admire our spirit. We've got financial members from Hungary, Poland, South America. Um, that's just off the top of my head. These people, have, some of them, their English is the English is not great, but they've heard of us, they've read of us, and they admire us. So we owe it to them to show them that we can do this. On, um, where are we today? Wednesday. I lose track of the days. It felt like Friday last night. On Tuesday, I delivered some trade me, a couple of trade me items to a bloke in Rotorua. He missed the, missed the boat by not sorting himself out in time. I had to work I had to work in um, in Rotorua, so I took the stuff over to him. I was happy to hand the stuff over to him. He gave me 20 bucks for taking the trouble to deliver to him. He really appreciated it, and I reckon he won't forget me for a long time. So that just goes to show we do our things in our Rhodesian way and it gets recognised. So let's keep that Rhodesian spirit running. The time is now. Please, spread the word. Get everybody behind us. Get them on our email, everybody listening in and seeing what we're doing. This is the time, and we can make a success of this and set in place a lasting legacy. Thank you, folks. That's all I've got to say to you today. Tony Fraser has got our slouch hat. Please, can we please donate generously? We have paid um, the association paid for the paid for the wreath and um, <coughs> paid for the wreath and a donation to the um, to the Hobsonville RSA. Um, generally, we've been that that's what um, that's what we've been collecting for. But like I've said, every bit counts. Please, we're going to move forward from this. 
and we're going to do it. You have a safe journey. Can I have some bearers to convey the...